How you doing? Thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Chris Tremolia from the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, I have a brief two-part question. So first part is you mentioned how China uh, wants to be the Asian hegemon and also an international power but without the responsibility. Uh, would you say that their investments in places like Africa and Italy is signifying a shift from that, that they do actually want to engage more and be like an international hegemon? Um, and second, you didn't speak about this much, but I did uh, my honors thesis on Arctic geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And the U.S., uh, a lot of that focuses on the, between U.S. and Russia and how the U.S. lags behind as far as in infrastructure and development. China has passed their Polar Silk Road initiatives over the past couple of years. What would you say um, pertaining to U.S.-China relations, the future is in that regard between U.S. and China if, in the Arctic? Okay, great. So two-part question that's really two separate questions, but sure. Okay, two-part question. Um, so on the first one, so when I talked about China wanting the rights without the responsibilities, you know, what I'm talking about is the responsibility, for example, for maintaining peace and stability globally, right? That's something China's interested in. Its investments in Africa uh, uh, and elsewhere, for example, through the Belt and Road, are things that it does because it believes that, you know, it will gain uh, you know, economic influence, uh, that will gain political influence, um, but it's not about a responsibility, right? Um, you know, it's not about uh, having responsibility for, for example, uh, you know, when the United States withdrew from uh, Paris Climate Accord, you know, began the process of withdrawing, you know, it was a great opportunity for China to step up on the global stage, right, and say, uh, okay, actually, we should also be working forward to uh, develop uh, more uh, stringent, uh, you know, targets, right? More aggressive targets for reducing CO2. Or why don't we have an agreement on methane uh, emissions? But it doesn't do anything like that, right? China doesn't step up and propose, uh, you know, international uh, agreements that in any way will cost it, right? It looks for its self-interest. It still operates, and you see this um, a lot in the way that it behaves in the United Nations, it still operates from a position of very narrow self-interest. That's what I'm referring to when I say it wants the rights but not the responsibilities. Um, in terms of uh, the Arctic, yeah, so this is an area where I think um, the Trump administration really um, started to take a lot of interest in this. So um, the Arctic space and maritime are three areas where China has stated now that it really wants to expand its influence. It said this in, the, in that March 2 sessions meeting that, that I mentioned. But China has been working very gradually, but with, with very, um, since you did your honors thesis on this, you know, um, you know, since, you know, for over a decade now in the Arctic, right? So beginning with research, um, developing, um, I think it's done more um, uh, research now, um, expeditions uh, to Antarctica and the Arctic combined than any other country. Um, it is an observer in the Arctic Council, but not a member. So it has the opportunity to put forth ideas for how the Arctic should be governed, but it can't decide any of those things, right? Those are only done by the Arctic countries themselves. So China likes to call itself a near polar power or something like that, right? And, and Secretary Pompeo said, like, there is no such thing, right? There's, you're either Arctic power or you're not, and you're not China. Um, uh, but, but I think gradually it's trying, what I think it's trying to do now actually is reframe um, the understanding of the issues surrounding the Arctic. So talking about climate change and saying that this is actually an issue of global commons. And so it needs to be um, negotiated uh, by a much broader range of countries than simply those Arctic countries. So I think this is a long-term play on the part of China. Um, what, what is good that's happened just in the past few years is that China was doing a lot of investment in infrastructure, or was trying to do a lot of investment in infrastructure in other Arctic countries, and they seem to be welcoming it. But, but gradually, and I, again, here I give the Trump administration a lot of credit. I think you know, they sounded a lot of alarm bells um, about Chinese investment and sort of the dual nature of Chinese investment. And so you've seen you know, countries begin to become aware of the fact that yeah, this guy who says he wants to develop a huge golf resort in Iceland, right, might have some other things going on, might have something else, might somehow be tied to the Chinese government, might want to develop some kind of monitoring, you know, station there. So um, now you're seeing a lot of these same countries refuse Chinese investment. Um, so I think the tide has shifted a little bit um, so that countries are much more wary of, of China's role in the Arctic. 
Where we've fallen short is in terms of our own investment in our resources to be able to participate in things like Arctic expeditions. Our Coast Guard is also vastly underfunded. Um, you know, I, I can't remember the, the number, and I should, um, because the Commandant of the Coast Guard <laughs> talks about it all the time, you know, how many icebreakers China has, Russia, and then the US is like here. You know? And so you know how many. We have two. Right, but they've got how they're on track to have like 25 or so or something like that. Yeah, right, 40 or so, Russia, right. So we're, we're not even in the game at this point in time. Um, so I think that's something that um, I'm hopeful the Biden administration is, is going to think about. Um, and in my new position at Commerce, I'm planning to help them think about it. Okay, so, all right, um, yeah. I'm curious in your discussions with your Chinese counterparts over the past year, how, um, how surprised are they by, for example, on the private and public sector, like Xi Jinping extending his ability to stay in, in, in office, um, essentially like gutting some private investment in a lot of these tech firms? Uh, I'm curious their reactions at sort of the below public level. Yeah, I think, um, you know, they are um, less surprised and very, very depressed. So when I think about sort of people that I interact with, and I think about like in the, let's call it the creative class, right? So people in scholarly, entrepreneurs, in the scholarly sector and the entrepreneurs, they're extremely depressed uh, because they're, um, you know, bandwidth, right, for experimentation, for entrepreneurialism, right, um, has become increasingly constrained. Uh, you know, I think people, so I'm, I'm good friends with a real estate billionaire. And she and her husband um, uh, have been gradually moving all their assets out of China over the past, you know, five to seven years. I think these people, you know, have seen they they understand Chinese politics better than someone like I could ever understand Chinese politics. Um, and so, you know, they've been very careful. I think someone like Jack Ma, right, who spoke out, right, the the you know one of the founders of Alibaba, who spoke out and criticized uh, the Chinese government and the sort of um, you know, the degree of regulation uh, of the tech sector and the inability of tech regulators basically to keep up with entrepreneurs, right? Um, you know, I think in his mind, you know, he had gotten to a point where he was kind of invincible. Um, and, uh, and I think for some of these billionaires who've now been sentenced to jail, there have been a couple um, Ren Zhe Chang, who was sentenced to jail for saying that Xi Jinping was, uh, you know, um, a uh, uh, an emperor with no clothes, right, during COVID. Um, so 18 years in jail, he's 67 years old, big, huge real estate billionaire. Recently, there was um, someone, a, another billionaire who did a lot of uh, work in agriculture, sentenced to jail also for 18 years because he supported lawyers who were defending the rights of farmers. Um, so I think the message is being sent now that that there is no one who is you know, too big uh, to, to fail. Uh, and I think you've also seen you know, that um, founder of uh, TikTok, you know, has stepped down. The founder of Pinduoduo has stepped back. So all of these big tech entrepreneurs are moving out of the limelight or resigning their positions. Um, and I think that's an acknowledgement, um, you know, of the fact that their space is just, you know, becoming smaller and smaller. Um, so I think it's, I think they're not enormously surprised, um, but I think they are extremely depressed. I'm looking for a young woman. Okay, you're not, but go ahead. <laughs> I noticed a lot of women asked questions the last session, so go ahead. Uh, a few months ago, there was like an issue of The Economist, which came out, which you know was titled "The Most Dangerous Place in the World," and of course, uh, you know the the image they had attached was a map of Taiwan. Um, so you know, I was wondering, you know, how dire is the situation t in Taiwan? How realistic um, is it that we could see, you know, an invasion um, by China and an attempt to, you know, take it? Uh, for themselves, clearly they think of it as their own, um, uh, their own territory. And then in that case, uh, you know, what does an optimal U.S. response look like? Is there a, um, any realistic way that we can, you know, prevent it? And what, how do we, you know, respond in this case? Yeah. Um, so you've hit on. Um, I mentioned the fact that there's a big debate in the China field over the issue of whether China is exporting its model. The second huge debate is on this issue of whether or not uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, has in his mind uh, to take over Taiwan, you know, within so the next 
you know, five to 10 years. And Admiral Davidson, who's the just retired head of Indo-PACOM, right before he left said he believed that she has in his mind, you know, within the next six years or so to, to take action. I tend to agree with him. So um, I think if you read Xi Jinping's speeches, you know, and he's got now 2,000 pages of speeches published, so you can go and read them if you want to understand what he's thinking and where he's going. It's, it's all laid out there. And he is nothing if not consistent. There's really no mystery to him. Um, you know, he, you know, year after year after year, he basically says the same thing. And Taiwan, um, without, without Taiwan becoming part of China, there is no great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Um, so from my perspective, for Xi Jinping, his legacy will be a failure if in some way, shape, or form, Taiwan is not formally you know, incorporated into the mainland. Having said that, you know, when is that gonna happen? I don't think it happens until um, uh, the PLA you know, says we can, we can win, right? There's no way that Xi Jinping wants you know, the PLA to go out there and then they suffer you know, a humiliating loss. How do we you know, prevent that from even you know, coming to, um, you know, to, you know, to a point where they could believe that? I think part of it is, has to be, um, well, there are a couple of things. Number one, Taiwan itself has to you know, up its game in its own self-defense. Um, so they no longer have mandatory uh, conscription. They need to, to demonstrate that they are willing to go uh, you know, to bat for their own nation. Uh, and they're not at that stage yet. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I think we need to draw in more countries. And I think that is something that the Trump administration started to do and the Biden administration is continuing to do. Uh, so it's not just about the U.S. coming to the defense of Taiwan. We've been putting a lot of pressure on countries like Japan and Australia, I think increasingly Europe, uh, to come to support Taiwan. Not just support them uh, you know, in the United Nations, right? There's a big movement around COVID to say Taiwan should be, you know, have access to the World Health Assembly meetings, um, and not just in other international agreements and arrangements, but actually militarily. So I think, you know, to the extent that you can weave a web of, of international support around Taiwan, I think that's important. I think we need to stop taking actions that mm, poke at China, um, but don't actually do anything substantive in terms of enhancing Taiwan's security. So I think one of the mistakes we made with Hong Kong, for example, is when Congress passed the um, Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, you know, they, they thought that this was going to be enough to save Hong Kong. They thought this would prevent mainland China from doing exactly what it did, right? Namely saying, oh, you know, we will pull our recognition of Hong Kong as a separate entity. Um, we will sanction you. But what, what people don't understand, what, or at least what Congress didn't fully understand, was that there is no greater issue for C than sovereignty, right? And so the threat of Hong Kong and this incredible democracy movement, I mean, it was incredible, right? Um, you know, really pushing, you know, past the point of simply, um, you know, one country, two systems. I mean, you did have calls, you know, for, um, you know, a greater form of independence. Um, you know, was, was just too much. And dating back to 2014, you could see, you know, Xi Jinping telling the UK in speeches, not directly, but in speeches that he gave saying, the UK has no more call on Hong Kong. The UK's role and influence in Hong Kong ended at the time of the handover. So, you know, the laws and the joint declaration, all that stuff, doesn't, didn't matter to him, right? So I think with Taiwan, you know, what we need to be doing is not really passing things like the Taiwan Travel Act and things where we say, okay, our senior officials can go and meet with Taiwanese senior officials. Okay, that's great. But do we really need to have, you know, the ambassador from, was it Fiji? I can't remember now. Traveling with, you know, the official from Fiji to Taiwan as kind of some kind of statement. I think it's a mistake. Right? It doesn't do anything to protect Taiwan, doesn't do anything to enhance their security, but what it does do is enrage the mainland. So from my perspective, what we should be doing is tamping down the sort of political rhetoric stuff surrounding Taiwan and increasing, you know, like talk softly and carry a big stick. I think that needs to be our, our uh, strategy moving forward um, because all we're doing right now is, you know, poking them and not actually doing anything that's going to improve the situation.
Yes. Um, so you mentioned po political rhetoric. Um, and I think I want to pivot the conversation just a little bit, and we can go back um, to foreign policy stuff. But I want to talk about like how we um, talk about foreign policy um, in the US, like you know, especially with the relationships with China, um, and against the background of Asian hate crime in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, after the whole COVID happened and the way um, people perceived Chinese role in it. So I, would, I just want to yeah. um, ask you, like, how? Do we, um, you know, balance that, and how we walk that thin line between making sure um, that we are putting pressure on, uh, you know, our foreign adversaries or people, uh, you know, countries, but at the same time make sure that we are protecting um, the citizens and the immigrants who are living um, in the U.S. Right. I think that's a hugely um, important issue, and um, you know, part of it, I will say, you know, was unleashed. Um, by the previous administration with things like Kung Flu and the Wuhan virus and, and um, a failure to distinguish right between China, the country, and what it was doing, and Chinese people. And, um, and a, a lack of any you know, empathy, um, you know, I mean, frankly, any empathy for what was going on inside China itself, right, for the Chinese people, what they were uh, enduring at the time. Um, and so, uh, um, in fact, I argued, not argued, I pushed um, uh, with my friends who were in the Trump administration for them to stop talking about the Wuhan virus, right, and just not use language like that. Um, I mean, I think it, it has to come from the very top, right? It has to come from, um, you know, leadership from President Biden, from his team, you know, making clear that, uh, you know, Chinese people, Asians have nothing to do right, here in the United States have nothing to do with, you know, our policy toward China, that there is a separation between what the Chinese government is doing uh, and, you know, people here in the United States. Um, I think there is a really useful movement that's developing among um, Asian Americans. Um, in fact, so Jerry Yang out here is part of it. Um, uh, a number of prominent uh, Asian Americans uh, are sort of stepping up and saying, uh, you know, you can't, you can't do this, right? Making their voices heard in a way that I think uh, Asian voices typically haven't been heard, uh, right? Uh, you know, model minorities, you know, the quiet, uh, you know, work hard, do well, et cetera. Well, um, clearly that is, hasn't served them very well, you know, at this point in time. And I think they're stepping up and, and making their voices heard. And I think that's really uh, important. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important issue. And you know, it's something that, um, you know, every one of us has to make clear that there is a difference here um, and not conflate the two. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I would just say over like the last 18 months, there's really been like a failure of framing the origins of this virus. And I mean, like, this is a lot worse than Chernobyl. And Chernobyl was a big deal back in the 80s. I mean, like 4.5 million people have died globally from this thing, and it was a Chinese Communist Party cover-up. And I mean, if I was a leader in the global community, whether you're in Brazil or in India or in Europe, I'd be pretty pissed that we have all these people dying from a disease that came from a lab in China that escaped, and then they covered it up, and it was released on the world. And I feel like the United States and the global con or you know global community needs to hold China you know to the fire for this. I mean, it's. A lot of people died. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I agree with you that um, there was a cover up in the initial, you know, month or so. Uh, that the Chinese, the nature of the Chinese political system, did very little um, in terms of. And we saw what happened with Dr. Li Wenliang, right? Um, you know, the whistleblowers early on uh, that you know they were basically hauled in and told you know not to say anything. Um, but I would also note, and I would say, you know, also that it goes to show it's a good example of why, um, you know, China's role in the United Nations matters so much because the fact that it had so much sway within the World Health Organization, not because of its economic contribution, which is minuscule, by the way, compared to the U.S.'s, um, but because it had supported Tedros. <laughs> Actually, Tedros went and spoke um, at either Tsinghua or Beida uh, last summer. I mean, it's like ridiculous. Um, so I agree with you up to that point. However, <laughs> You know, past the point of, of January 30th, February 1st, you know, moving into that scheme, into that period of time, look, we are responsible for our own actions. 
And you know, the fact that upwards of 600,000 Americans have died is not due to China's cover-up. It's due to our response, how we managed this. Um, you know, from that point that we understood what this virus was about. It's the high degree of transmissibility, uh, the devastation that it could wreak on people. Even today, we have political leaders in this country that are unwilling to uh, take the necessary precautions, right, in the midst of a pandemic. You know, I, so, you know, from my perspective, you are right. We do need to hold China accountable. And I think the international community continues to push. And I am heartened by the fact that, you know, the lab, um, uh, you know, the potential that it came from a lab is being uh, explored again, right? Because, yes, when you study China, you know, if something is like, you know, five feet away from where the virus first appeared, it's possible it came from that lab. It is possible. It's possible it didn't, right? But it should be fully explored. So I agree with you on that. I agree that there was a cover-up. But I don't agree uh, that we should be offloading the entire responsibility for deaths in the United States or anywhere else onto China. We bear, at this point, in my opinion, uh, we bear our own responsibility for what's happened. So, okay. Uh, yes? Um, just kind of like thinking about the Red Scare, like McCarthyism, kind of like chaos internally in the United States. Um, how do you suggest we balance thinking of China and like, um, communism and like the threat to democracy um, as a real threat without uh, kind of falling into paranoia ourselves? Right. So I think that's a really good question. Um, so one of the things, um, so right now I'll just say at Hoover, we're doing a project um, that I'm, I'm co-chairing a project on China's digital currency with Daryl Duffy, who is a, um, a professor at the uh, Stanford Business School. And uh, so one of the things that we are committed to doing, so you may have seen China's digital currency, the you know, ECNY or DCEP as it's called sometimes, has gotten a lot of attention recently. You know, people think that it's gonna transform uh, the world of finance, that it's gonna mean that you know, the, the yuan is gonna replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. There's a lot of hype around it, you know, that it's gonna enable China to do much greater uh, monitoring and surveillance, not only at home, but globally. So there's a lot that goes, along with this. So one of the things that we're committed to doing is looking very granularly at the facts, right? And, and so from my perspective, the way that you prevent that scenario from happening, that kind of, is you don't begin with, you know, writing a piece that says, red communist China. You know, you begin by saying, here's what's happening on the ground. Here's how this currency works, right? Here's what China's already capable. So for me, I was concerned about this currency, the digital currency. Um, as I began to explore it more, I began to see actually, let's call it 80% of China's capabilities in monitoring, oh, we're totally out of time, sorry. <laughs> capabilities um, for monitoring uh, the people already exists, right? So what the, the e yuan is, what the ECNY is, is gonna be additive. It is gonna enhance China's capabilities in many regards to do things that we don't like, but will it transform? There are probably a couple of ways, right? And our report will talk about them. But, but I guess my point is just so you, you follow the facts. And actually, that's something that, um, that uh, uh, Condi Rice, the president of Hoover, says all the time. You follow the facts. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing we can do. Sorry for going over time. Josh, I'm sorry. <laughs>